it may sound straightforward in terms of just having the legal team look at the emerging regulations, but think about the knock-on effect about of how the sanctions can impact the market. You may have some emerging risk exposure that you don't know about unless you can truly examine the geopolitical risks of the situations that you're facing. Companies operating in today's global economy really need to get an understanding of the international geopolitical risk landscape. At Infortel Worldwide, we work with our clients on solving risk before it starts. Welcome to the Riskology Podcast, where we're looking at managing business risk globally and really understanding the geopolitical risk landscape. Good afternoon, evening, and night, depending on your time zone. And welcome to another episode of Riskology by Infertile, where we combine the worlds of intelligence, business, and geopolitics to help you understand how geopolitical risk affects your bottom line. We have something really interesting today. I'm going to kick it right over to my colleague, Chris Mason. This is a game changer. Really exciting stuff. Just released last week. So it was actually the keynote speaker last week in Chicago for the Society of Corporate Compliance and Ethics. At their annual conference, they had Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco come out to speak on the emerging priorities for the DOJ in terms of compliance. And there's some real striking policy guidance in this recent set of announcements. I strongly recommend hitting the DOJ's website It's dated October 4th of last week, 2023, of course. Strongly recommend checking it out. We're going to dissect sort of the main areas of coverage, and there's some really great quotes that Ian and I are going to talk through and explain what you can do within your company to make sure that you're aligned with these priorities, which are pretty significant. And so before we jump into it, I'll just give you the overview of sort of how the comments and the policy announcements are shaped. And first of all, there's really an expression of a commitment from the DOJ in terms of prioritizing going after the enforcement of corporate compliance failures, particularly in the context of national security. So where compliance failures meet national security, and we'll go through what that can look like, that's really going to be a major focus area for the U.S. Department of Justice. They're committed to hiring uh, 25 new prosecutors in that area. So whenever the DOJ makes that move, it's clear that that's going to be an area of focus and a significant amount of investment. So we'll go through that in a minute. Secondly, kind of interesting, the DOJ has really looked significantly at how companies can incentivize executives to do the right thing. And it's really important to make sure that even your compensation packages are aimed at incentivizing the executives the right way. And third, the next sort of major announcement, and this one's really exciting for Ian and I because it's an area of focus for us with our clients, and that's in the world of mergers and acquisitions. And now there's a more formal safe harbor policy, which really rewards companies for doing proper due diligence. And what I love about this announcement, and we'll jump right into it, is there's a clear link to geopolitical risk mentioned directly by the Department of Justice in examining how you approach international mergers and acquisitions. And before I kick it over to Ian to kick us off with some of those national security implications that I alluded to earlier, I thought I would read one of the quotes. The Deputy Attorney General mentioned that companies today confront a complex geopolitical environment something that we focus heavily on here at Infortal Worldwide. And the Deputy Attorney General commended the fact that many companies are responding commendably, was the word chosen. However, a lot of companies it's recognized by the Department of Justice have not kept pace with today's compliance challenges. Think about everything that's going on in the world in terms of compliance, money laundering, conflict around the world. All of that leads to enhanced risk. Something else that the Deputy Attorney General focused in on was the fact that companies have prudently been exiting markets that pose undue risk. That's becoming more and more important. And we're seeing more and more companies consider reshoring and nearshoring based upon the risk profiles of the jurisdictions that they've been operating in historically. 
So that being said, let's jump into it and let's really focus in on the intersection of compliance and national security and why it's so important to make sure that you have the right tools in place to tackle geopolitical risk and really any types of risks that fall into the national security camp. So Ian, I thought I would pass it to you to kick us off with that discussion. Thanks, Chris. This is exciting stuff. It's cutting edge. And thankfully, it looks like there's some acknowledgement that the business world is at the forefront of not only helping mitigate risk and keeping the economy going, but also just general stability. And I think this is something that everybody needs to keep in mind that we talk about geopolitical risk. We're not just talking about the highly unlikely possibility that soldiers are going to kick down the door of your office and drag you out and confiscate your property. But all these geopolitical risks, whether you're talking about Russia's invasion of Ukraine, you're talking about the war that's kind of growing in the Middle East, or you're talking about tensions with China, those risks trickle down into potential threats to your operations and liabilities in ways that may not seem directly related. You're going to have companies that are going to be at risk of having their products or services misused, whether that be by governments trying to circumvent sanctions or by terrorist groups. Let's say you have a product that all of a sudden is used in a terrorist attack without you knowing it. You could have inadvertently a company, you maybe you're doing a deal in East Asia, and all of a sudden you realize that the representative that you're working with is actually tied to a state-owned enterprise and works for a hostile government and they could be trying to steal intellectual property. Or maybe you're in the shipping business and a sanctions violator in Russia is trying to use your company to violate trade restrictions in order to get material into Russia or out of Russia for import or export and violate EU sanctions or US sanctions. It comes down to transactions. It's not just, well, the world of geopolitics is separate from my business. It's not. It's going to show up in ways that are not readily apparent unless you're doing due diligence. But the good news is, if you are doing due diligence, you can actually avoid a lot of the risks from potential prosecution, reputational risks, and just violating federal law now as the U.S. government starts to crack down. So you can actually avoid these risks by implementing good due diligence and intelligence systems into your business. So while this may be a burden, this is also an opportunity for you to not only stay in compliance, but also to avoid risk altogether and mitigate the damage if risk emerges. And again, it's really striking that the term geopolitical risk was a major focus of the comments that were made at the conference just last week. And that's really where it gets complicated for a lot of companies, because typically in the past, or at least to a certain degree, companies have thought about political and geopolitical risk in terms of safety and security, which is very important and fundamental to geopolitical risk analysis. But it's also important to consider geopolitical risk in the context of how that can change conditions on the ground where you're doing business and ultimately increase your risk exposure to certain areas and certain things that you wouldn't normally think of in the security context, things like sanctions regimes that are evolving. It may sound straightforward in terms of just having the legal team look at the emerging regulations, but think about the knock-on effect about of how the sanctions can impact the market. You may have some emerging risk exposure that you don't know about unless you can truly examine the geopolitical risks of the situations that you're facing. And just to give you a sense of the penalties in this space, and these are also highlighted in the comments that are available on the DOJ's website, there's a French firm called Lafarge. They were fined $775 million in penalties for essentially admitting to paying the Islamic State and an Al-Qaeda affiliate. Now, imagine the reputational damage there, not to mention the 775 million right off the bat. Put that in the context of what's going on in the world today, particularly in Israel. You do not want to be seen on the wrong side of these situations. Similarly, another company, British American Tobacco, they entered 
into a deferred prosecution agreement and paid $635 million for violating U.S. sanctions. And that was in terms of selling tobacco in North Korea. So it's staggering, right? And these are major companies. These are large organizations with robust or seemingly robust compliance departments. And so it's really important that you make sure that your compliance program and your department is able to pivot and respond to emerging geopolitical risks as they arise. Chris, you bring up such an interesting case with British tobacco and North Korea, because on the surface, it seems laughable that that tobacco would have anything to do with national security. But that's at the same time, that kind of highlights this point very vividly in that you had a company that sold hundreds of million, you know, who knows how much tobacco to North Korea. And while it may not have seemed like a national security risk to that company at the time, it nonetheless turned out to be one. And that affected the government's actions. So it actually does affect liability, even if it may not seem like a specific transaction or deal may actually put you at risk for violations. That's not necessarily the case. Yeah. That's a great point. And it's just staggering the magnitude of the fines in this space. But longer term, the reputational damage is going to far exceed any of these penalties that are here. And again, I know I mentioned it before, but these are not minor players. These are large organizations. And so if it can happen in that type of an organization, you really need to make sure that you're assessing where you stand today. And that's really what the DOJ is looking at. Now, we won't go as deeply into this topic today, but still very interesting. And I think something to think about and how you shape your own internal policies. But that's the fact that the DOJ is looking at how you incentivize compliance minded behavior in the context of compensation for executives. And so that's something that the DOJ is planning to more heavily take into account. And that's the fact that if executives are caught in a situation where they were responsible for a compliance failure or a situation where they should have known to act and avoid the situation that occurred, there should be a penalty imposed by the company itself to that individual in terms of compensation. And so the DOJ is looking very heavily at that. But I think taking a step back, and I'd be interested to get your take, Ian, That's one of the key fundamental elements of any compliance program is how you're incentivizing your employees to act. It's not as easy as just writing it down on paper and giving a training, but you've really got to reinforce that. And I think where it gets challenging, and this is where we help our clients unpack the risk dynamics, is once you start looking at operating overseas and in international markets, how do you incentivize those teams? Yeah. Because this is new in that it's not just forcing a strategic change on the companies and that you have companies that now have to calculate geopolitical risk and take these different things into account where they never would have before. But it's also forcing an organizational change within the business itself. Just the risk environment in general now are forcing companies to have to build new skills and potentially new personnel and areas of expertise where they would not have had to before. Now, because of the executive liability, executives certainly have an incentive now by law, or at least by enforcement, to understand geopolitical risk. You're going to have corporate legal counsel that's now going to have to understand this, probably marketing as well as traditional compliance officers. So you're looking at the creation of a whole new area of expertise and demand within the compliance space and in the corporate space in general in terms of how to understand geopolitical risk. And this is where Infratal comes in, or at least this is something that we have a large background in. We can actually train individuals through our certification programs or hands-on consulting and advising on how to screen partners, on how to handle due diligence, how to understand it. More importantly, so companies and executives can help navigate their own geopolitical risk. This is a game changer in terms of how business works. Yeah, I think it's important to note that when thinking about geopolitical risk and the potential compliance consequences, it's very much a dynamic situation. And so 
it's not something that you can just examine at one point in the year and then sort of put the analysis back on the shelf. You've really got to have a program that meets the needs of your company and make sure that you're continuing to assess conditions as they change so that you can make the changes and modifications to your programs as needed. And if you're not considering geopolitical risk in that context when you're making those decisions, you could end up with a hole or a major deficit in your program leading to some of these types of violations that we're seeing. With that being said, we'll jump into one of the key elements of the new announcements. This is by far my favorite. And I'll start with a quote before we even jump into it. Best quote in the entire document, in my opinion. And the quote is, in a world where companies are on the front line and responding to geopolitical risks, we are mindful of the danger of unintended consequences. Think about the magnitude of that statement. That really underlies a lot of what we're doing today with our clients. It's really putting them in a position to take risks, to take on opportunities in emerging markets and in emerging situations while also managing against compliance, national security, and all of the geopolitical risk situations that we've discussed before. That's really the name of the game. And the reason that quote is so important is because it comes in the context of mergers and acquisitions. And basically what the DOJ has done, and this has been emerging for some time now, is they've come up with a more formal policy aimed at rewarding companies for self-disclosing compliance issues and compliance breakdowns in the mergers and acquisition space. And so I think the best way to think through this, and of course, it's called the safe harbor policy for voluntary self-disclosures is sort of the formal name of this. And the best way to think about it is if you're acquiring a company in an emerging market, it's really important to get your due diligence right. It's also really important to continue that due diligence even beyond the point of finalizing the deal to make sure that there's no hidden risks, there's no hidden compliance issues. And if you do discover that, the key now is to self-report that to the Department of Justice so that you won't be unjustly penalized for those issues. And something to note is there is a shot clock on this. So there's a six-month period from the point of acquisition to really self-report any of those issues. It may seem like a tight timeline, but if you think about it, it should start on the first day that you're even beginning to consider acquiring a new company. You should really map out the game plan beyond the financial analysis, beyond the market projections. But what does the risk analysis look like that you need to conduct going into the deal? And once you start looking at international jurisdictions, once you start looking at emerging markets, you really need to tailor that with boots on the ground intelligence to understand how you can even uncover these risks. And Something that's important to note in an area where this comes up quite frequently is in the space of Foreign Corrupt Practices Act violations, and that's where there's under the table bribes going on. Now, in cultures overseas where there's a heavy culture of bribery, that's not something that's going to be immediately apparent. The ones that are conducting business in that way are not immediately going to come to the table and explain to you all of the different situations that have transpired before you arrive there. So you need to get an understanding of how the contracts that are in place were acquired, and you need to get an understanding of the local business culture so that you know the questions to ask those key individuals. And the only way that you can realistically do that in new or emerging markets is to gain an understanding through boots on the ground intelligence. And that's something that we focus heavily on here. That's one of our strengths is that we have the ability to go into tons of different countries, most countries, and offer you an inside look, not only into who you're doing business with, but also the situation and the intelligence surrounding the risks related to not only that transaction, but those partners, the geopolitics of that specific country, its culture, how that can impact your risks here as it relates to these new regulations that are emerging. And then after a transaction, especially if you're talking about an M&A, what this allows you to do is that if you do decide to acquire risk, this 
information and this intelligence allows you to mitigate that risk after the transaction is complete so that you're still in compliance. And something to note is that the Department of Justice has been very clear about a few different elements of how they're planning to apply this new policy. And one is where the presumption lies. And so there's an initial presumption, something that's important to note with this new policy announcement, which has formalized a lot of the recent practices within the FCPA space, as an example, is the fact that companies will now receive the presumption of a declination of prosecution if you are voluntarily disclosing criminal misconduct within the safe harbor period of that six months from the date of closure. So that's to reinforce the fact that if you report, if you self-report the criminal activity, the presumption is that you will go down the path of declination, depending on the facts of the case, of course. And then something else to be mindful of is there are some reasonableness factors. Of course, with any type of legal scenario, there's always going to be a layer of reasonableness applied. And so deals are going to be assessed a little bit differently. There's definitely going to be some nuance in terms of complexity. But going back to what we were discussing before, this safety harbor policy really shouldn't start for you at the date of closure to six months after. It should really start that day that you're considering acquiring a company overseas. You should really start mapping out then exactly how you're going to tackle the risk analysis and the risk profile. But here we go with another quote. So within the comments, it says that the last thing that the department wants to do is discourage companies with effective compliance programs from lawfully acquiring companies with ineffective compliance programs and a history of misconduct. Instead, we want to incentivize the acquiring company to timely disclose misconduct uncovered during the M&A process. So think about that. The DOJ here is recognizing that companies are on the front lines of tackling geopolitical risk. And the idea is to not discourage investment overseas, even if there's a track record of problems. The best situation would be a good company with a solid track record is able to acquire another company that may have had a somewhat checkered past and can actually turn that into a much more profitable, much more successful company that doesn't violate what we would consider national security or wouldn't violate compliance regulations that would in turn cause national security violations. So the DOJ is recognizing that. The key is just making sure that your due diligence is adequate to meet the analysis for the deal that you're looking at. I'll turn it back to Ian, and I believe you might have a quote as the quote off continues for the listeners here. This is the key takeaway. This is the coup de grace, the pièce de, de résistance for your corporate compliance. Monaco said something pretty telling. Of course, it's your job to protect your company, but in doing so, you're also focusing on robust compliance, investing in good corporate governance, but you're also looking at national security. This is something that most executives don't understand, but regardless of what your business is, your business is essential. You're customers rely on your service for a reason. Your employees certainly rely on you for a reason. Your investors rely on you for income. You actually are an element. Your company is an element to sociopolitical and geopolitical stability. And unfortunately, the world has gotten so complex and so potentially dangerous, although there's tons of opportunities to be had, that it really behooves companies to look at deals and partnerships and risks before they act in any given transaction, but also after the fact in order to rectify risks. This is a new era that's emerging in terms of compliance, but also opportunity, because what this does, this allows you to potentially take on risks that you previously would not have even taken. This allows you to take on risks before and mitigate those risks after the fact and still remain in compliance. And I think this is where there's opportunity to be had, as well as liabilities to be avoided. You're looking at a new era. This is a new age in terms of geopolitical risk management at the corporate level, certainly, and a whole new level of understanding that executives can have 
in terms of taking new opportunities, even amid the chaos. So we really appreciate you all joining us. Hopefully you'll tune in for the next episode of Riskology by Overtall Worldwide. Stay safe out there and give us a call.